Um, all right, let's give it up for Adrian. Okay, I'm gonna try the clicker in one hand, microphone in the other thing, and definitely not gonna mess anything up. Uh, so this is my last two wave presentation. I've done like a lot of these over the years, so kind of feeling a little sentimental. My name is Adrian Betridge-Wiese. Um, for about the next six work days, I will be the Chief Operations Officer at Two Wave, which is a local consulting firm. I'm also the head front-end developer. After that, I'm gonna be an engineering manager at Granular, so hi. <laughs> nice to see you all again, been a little bit. Um, if you came to the last talk that I gave, it was kind of nebulous about decision-making. This one, Larry told me they were looking for some sort of more low-level um, introductory stuff, so I decided to talk about implementing front-end. Um, before I get started, how many of you like really love writing HTML, feel really comfortable with it, and CSS? Okay, that's more hands than I would expect frequently. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, ooh, CSS. I love CSS. Um, also, before I get started, there is a link at the end of the talk to the slides online, so you don't have to take pictures of the slides if there's stuff that you're interested in. Um, for those of you who are like feeling really solid about CSS and markup, oh boy, the clicker's gonna work. There we go. Um, this isn't probably gonna have anything new for you, but maybe you'll get some ideas for how I approach stuff. Um, if you don't like CSS and markup, maybe you're gonna learn some things. Um, there is no like one true way to implement a front end, um, and I wouldn't at all claim for that. I've done, I think, about 20 of them over the last five years from scratch. Um, and I've done every single one of them differently, and why is this happening? Okay, so my sharing is stopped. We're not just... Are we back? There we go. Okay, so we're trying to record this thing on Zoom, and it's going great. Uh, good? Good. All right. Um, so like I said, uh, hopefully there's some good ideas here that can help you. If not, you can ask Larry for your money back. And the clicker. There we go. All right. So I work with a bunch of different kinds of clients, and very often not with a designer that I've ever met before, which means I get mock-ups of really wildly different quality. Sometimes I get this. And this is great. This is basically about what I would be hoping for, like measurements and color names and uh, like where the images are from and what the fonts are. Um, but often I get PDFs and good wishes. Um, or this, which is actually worse than no measurement at all for those of you who've tried to do anything. Um, site withheld to protect the innocent, but this is a real thing that was handed over to me. Um, for this exercise, I'm gonna use this mock-up, which I took from the book Refactoring UI, which is by the Tailwind CSS folks. Um, it's a really interesting book, especially if you find that you have to do like something for a front end without any guidance. Um, because while this talk is about implementing uh, mock-ups, it's not about making them. I'm a terrible UI designer. Um, so when I have to do stuff, I generally just follow their patterns. Um, I think it's a nice looking example of a, mark of a mock-up um, that has a bunch of problems in it. Like none of the stuff that I said was nice before. Uh, it's only for desktop layout. But it gives us a lot to work with. Um, basically, worst, worst case scenario. So good place to start. Um, you can't really talk about implementing front end without talking about accessibility. Um, it really needs to be the basically the building blocks of anything you do in, in the web, and the, especially on the front end, or when you're even developing apps. Um, and the reason for that, uh, well, okay, before I explain why, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, um, accessibility refers to a suite of tools and techniques that we use to allow people with disabilities um, to use the things that we make. Um, so frequently we're talking about screen readers, um, devices that allow people with vision disabilities to access the screen, but there are other tools too. Um, I used, used, to, used to use dictation software, which had to be really good at targeting elements when I told it to click on things. Um, so the reason I say that accessibility is basically the building block of anything that you do is that if we're not using accessible techniques in the markup and the styles that we write, we are creating tools that are inaccessible by definition, which means we're walling people off from the internet. Um, which is just frankly morally wrong um, because the things that we should, we're building should be accessible to everybody. But if you need an economic argument, I will tell you that courts increasingly view websites especially as public accommodations. And that means that they're subject to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that is a law that has enormous teeth and will destroy you if somebody decides to sue you under the ADA. So hey, there's an economic argument. But again, I don't think that you should need one. Um, and luckily, 
it's really not that hard these days to make accessible tools. Um, prior to HTML5 semantic, ele semantic element expansion, it kind of was. You had to do a lot of stuff with ARIA labels and ARIA roles, and so you had to do a bunch of extra work. But now, it's just the markup that you write is going to get you 95% of the way there. Um, there's a lot of work that's involved in the designer side of it, too, and that'd be an interesting talk for somebody who works with designers to give some time, maybe, about how to get you know, a designer who's not used to doing accessible mockups um, that work. But for today, I'll just talk about R in a bit. So semantic elements. OK, so brief overview of how screen readers work. Um, so a screen reader, its like best function is that it takes an HTML document, parses the whole thing, and it makes a document tree for the user. So the user can ask for a table of contents on the page and go to the, part, the point where they want. There's a bunch of other stuff it does. Um, and if you ever want to have a lot of fun, you can actually, if you've got a Mac, just turn VoiceOver on. It's a function option F5, I think. Um, and just try navigating around the page. You'll hear how it reads the names of elements. It reads the contents of them. It tells you when you can click on them, how many items are in a list. But the thing that's really important for this part that I'm talking about is that document tree that it makes. Um, so that's what we talked about having semantic elements. So what are semantic elements? Well, let's ask W3Schools because their definition is better than mine, right? It actually just means elements that convey what they are. So not divs, not spans, but elements that say, like, oh, I'm a table, I'm a link, I'm a button. Um, and in our case, there are a bunch of them that are really important for this. Uh, the most important is the H element, which is, say, H1 through H6, the heading elements. And then header, main, and footer, kind of self-explanatory. The weird thing about this, you can only have one main element in the page. You can have any number of headers and footers. I didn't write the rules. Um, nav, pretty self-explanatory. Again, those are links. Links go with the navs. Section is a catch-all. It just literally says exactly what it sounds like. Hey, this is a section. Article, standalone item that goes within a section. And then figure and fig caption, um, I could sort of wrap fig caption inside a figure, but figures indicate to somebody that there's a figure, and you'll put a figure in an image and a fig caption that describes it. Um, also, your image should have an alt tag that describes the content of the image. Um, so just using these semantic elements and using them correctly is going to provide a website that is at least in its most basic level successful to a screen reader. You're going to pass WCAGA using just semantic, semantic elements as long as you don't do wonky stuff with your styles and as long as it's visually passing like contrast ratios and all of that. Um, so when I start working on a front end, the first thing I do is actually just print the whole thing out. Um, you can just, I mean, I just print it out, grab a pen and start marking up the whole thing, sketch out what all the elements are and the element types, and I give them names. I'm going to use those names for styles, and then they're also going to be the names of components. I'll talk about component thinking here in a bit. So here's what that might look like for me. And wow, it is really hard to read the back black on the dark blue. I'm sorry about that. Um, so here I've got, you can see I've got it broken down. So I've got a header, main, and footer elements. I've got uh, site nav, and I've got the app call to action. I'm really just making up. I don't know what this mock-up does, but I've got a search element. Um, so each of these things, you see I've sort of named them, and inside I've got, oh, you can see my pointer, excellent. Event post is an article that goes inside this section that's an event container. And if I were to hand this to a screen reader, it would do okay, because um, it would look and it would go through the document flow and say, okay, well, this stuff is inside this section, which is inside this other section. It might even take a decent guess at the name, depending on how your screen reader is set up and if you've got IDs on stuff. But it doesn't really do an excellent job of understanding hierarchy and definitely doesn't know what the sections are. So if you pull up the outline in your screen reader, what you're going to get is section with two subsections, which doesn't help. Um, so to fix that, we need heading tags. And heading tags are numbered from one to six. Uh, sort of modern um, technique is to have one H1, basically. You have, that's your site title, then any number of H2s, and within your H2s or H3s, within your H3s or H4s, et cetera. Um, never break that flow. And every section of your page gets a heading tag. So you can see I've put in my H1 up here on the top left, which maybe you actually can't see, sorry. Um, H2, H2, et cetera, and here's an H3, and even all the way down to H4. Now, if I take this and I hand it to a screen reader, I'm going to get something that looks like this. Because it reads the headings, it understands hierarchy because of the numbers, and it knows that there are titles. So it takes the sections. And this is like way more useful for somebody that's on a screen reader. Now, 
you might have some questions about what I just showed you because I did some sort of weird things. Um, did I just tell you to put headings where your designer did not? I absolutely did. And will I end up with headings of, this, of different levels that are visually the same? Um, like it looks to me, just glancing here, the event title has the same, basically looks the same as the title on the events. Yeah. So finally, we get to talk about CSS, which is my real favorite thing. Um, here's my speech about headings. By default, your web browser is going to render each heading with progressively smaller font size um, because we've got all these defaults baked, baked into the browser for appearance. Um, but markup is not what we should be using to determine presentation. That's what CSS is for. That's why we all love CSS, right? We love CSS. Uh, so I actually, when I start a project, have this rule. Um, does anybody need me to explain how CSS works from like a fundamental level, how selectors and rules work? Okay, don't be shy. There's nothing embarrassed about it. I'm just gonna show you a bunch of CSS. Okay, so this is what I like to do. H1 through H6, make them all look exactly the same. And then from there, you style the headings to match the presentation you want because their heading level is for accessibility and document flow, document tree. But the presentation of them, that's up to your designer. And as for headings where your designer didn't put them, this is one of my favorite uh, classes that I'm actually gonna talk about it being a mix in a little later. Um, this takes any element and pulls it out of, the, out of the flow for a sighted user, but anybody using a screen reader, their screen reader is gonna see the element and gonna say like, okay, well this is you know, heading level two and here's the title of it. Um, if you look up at markup I write on, in apps all the time, you'll see I put it, throw a bunch of these in. That's so that people who are using it in a screen reader will be able to see it. Um, so you've got an outline now, and it's going to be accessible. And it's time to really like get going, start writing some CSS. Um, as a side note, you could also use a CSS framework. Um, I saw a bunch of heads nodding excitedly about Tailwind. Um, so like you can use Tailwind, or you can use any number of other things. I'm going to talk about writing your CSS from, by hand, because that's how I do it, and I think at least for me, now that I'm comfortable doing that, it goes way faster for me. And the, just, the file size is extremely light when you're writing just a few lines of CSS for everything. Um, but I recommend, like I mentioned earlier, you start working in components. So one file for each of your little components. So that main search thing that I said, that'd be a file all on its own. Um, and I like to have one for your markup and for your styles and for your JavaScript for a couple of reasons. One, it makes it really easy to find the things that you need to work on, um, rather than opening some monolithic file. And two, it lets you share components and reuse them. But it only lets you reuse them if you have tools to do so, which is why I like to talk about having some sort of templating engine. There are a bunch of these. Um, this is, uh, what, seven of them? This is probably a tenth of the number of temp templating engines that exist. Um, all of their purpose is so that you can build a page by saying, hey, use this component, and use this other component, and use this other component, et cetera. And Larry, do you need me to pause so you can, you need to look awkwardly we get some sandwiches? All right. Um, so for my part, I like to use Vue. Actually, I use Nuxt, which is server-side rendered Vue. Um, but I like Vue because it's got single file components. I can write just normal styles in JavaScript and the markup. Uh, but there's no wrong answer. Like, oh. I had a time already? No, so there's no wrong answer. You can write a perfectly functional site using PHP. Um, a lot of people do it, that's how WordPress works and WordPress still basically runs the world. Like the majority of the world's websites still use PHP. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but if you wanna start messing around, I mean, you can even use React for this. Um, so you're gonna see like a very small view example from me, but mostly we're gonna see is CSS. Um, the other thing that I think you really need and it's kind of not optional, you could actually survive without a templating engine, is a CSS preprocessor. Um, and the reason for this is that writing vanilla CSS takes a while, and you need to know all of the, if you were to write CSS by yourself, you would need to know every property that needed to be auto-prefixed. So if for nothing else at all, I think you want a pre CSS preprocessor. Um, these are the big three. I use SAS, and the reason I use SAS, it is the first one I found, and, and I haven't had to change. Um, I think they're all fine. I've actually written a fair amount of stylus. I've written less, less, but I have written some less. Um, all of them are gonna give you the ability to define variables. So you can define a color once and then call that. And so then if you happen to change the color of your blue, or um, like I saw a group on talk and they changed green like five times in the course of their development, right? So if you happen to change it, you change it in one place, just like 
writing JavaScript. Um, they also get you functions, which kind of let you write JavaScript in your CSS. Um, as opposed to CSS in your JavaScript, there's nothing wrong with that one either. Um, they give you mix-ins, so you can define one set of rules somewhere and pull it into elements where you need it. Um, and like I said, auto-prefixing, extremely important. So pick one. There are a ton of tutorials for getting any of them up and running. Um, it's not hard, and it's really going to pay off. You could also get a post processor if you really wanted to get funky and use post CSS, um, but you don't need that. Like you need, I think, a preprocessor. Um, and the nice thing about preprocessors, like I said, it takes it makes writing CSS faster. This is a SAS CSS rule. And before I take a long time to explain SAS, is anybody not familiar with SAS? Again, really no embarrassment. All right, I got it. I got a hand, so I'm going to explain it. Okay, so what SAS does is it takes, um, what all the preprocessors do is they take a set of files that you provide to them, they run them through their engine, and they spit out a CSS file or more than one at the end for you. Um, so this is an example of, a, of some SAS rules that I wrote. Um, so dot item is the name of our top level thing, and within it I've got color white, and I've got some stuff inside. So the ampersand means the current selector. So this is dot item hyphen hyphen active, and this is dot item underscore underscore child. Um, so I've written one set of rules that is going to pull out and render out for three things, for three elements, three selectors more properly. Um, you can also do cascade within these. So if I have dot item and then I had just done dot active, the rule that it spat out would be dot item dot active. So it saves you a lot of work, but um, you don't really need the sort of multi-level CSS selectors very often if you use a CSS syntax. Um, again, there are a bunch of these. I think that the BEM syntax, which is what you kind of saw earlier, is the easiest to learn. Um, so it's what I use because it's also the first one. I looked at some others. Um, are there any Pixo people here? No? Okay. Um, my stepbrother works at Pixo and basically told me I was an idiot for not using BEM long enough that I started using it. Um, so what BEM does is got a, it's, BEM stands for block element modifier. So block is a sort of top level thing. Elements are things that go inside of them, and blocks and elements can have modifiers. Um, you don't have to use any sort of syntax for writing CSS. You don't have to do anything I'm telling you. But this saves me a lot of work. Uh, it stops me from screwing up Cascade because I don't use element selectors. And it lets me just kind of know what I'm supposed to call things as long as I use fairly descriptive names. It does render extremely long class names. So if that bothers you, this is not going to be the right thing for you. Um, here is, by the way, that selector that I showed you before, written in sort of BEM syntax, rendered out by SAS. So it takes this, it pulls, okay, item color white out, item dash dash hyphen hyphen active color black, you can see that, and child color red. The other thing that's going to make your life a lot easier is using a normalizer. Um, Normalize.css, it's great. So, all your browsers basically behave the same, but they've got a bunch of little defaults that are different. The place that you're really going to feel it is in form elements. Buttons and inputs and drop downs and all of those things are like just slightly different and enough to drive you up the wall. Um, so what Normalize does is it takes all the things that are different about browser rendering and it has browser specific rules for each to bring you to one baseline so you can work from there. Okay. Let's talk about actually doing some implementation. Um, so I like to get the rough layout together just so I can sort of take a look at stuff, um, and also because uh, it gives us a good place to start talking about this really classic pattern of web design, which is there are you know, basically three websites you can ever make, but all of them are single column, right? They're all a header and some stuff and a footer, and how we manage that stuff is this. Um, We've got a header and a main and a footer. So since I'm using a templating engine, I would do something like this. And this is, I think this is the only view you're going to see, but app header, app main, app footer. I just gave them those component names. And app home is this section. It's not body because view only lets you nest stuff within a view, a view element, which is inside of the body. Um, but that's what I would have there. Now, the nice thing about HTML and this sort of single column stuff stacked onto each other build is that um, elements by default, they just kind of stack on top of each other. Uh, oops, ha, I'm skipping ahead of myself. Okay, 
So the other thing I like to do, because I want to actually see these elements, is get the colors right. But my designer didn't give me any colors. Um, you can do yourself a world of good in this work by learning a little bit of Illustrator and a little bit of Photoshop. Um, now, I say that as kind of blithely. I realize it's $500 worth of software. Um, but if you don't know what's going on in a mock-up and somebody handed you a PDF, you can open it in Illustrator, tell it the page you want, and you can just start double-clicking on an element until the, thing, the right thing is selected. And it's usually going to take a while because everything's got like clip groups and actual groups, but you can get down to the point where you can get this color, right? Or that color. And so you can get exactly what you need. You can get dimensions even, which are generally just going to be kind of like, a, oh, this is about this size, right? Oh, it's a third of the container. Um, if you've got Photoshop, if it's just a raster image, you can do similar things. Um, this is going to save you a lot of time because you don't have to go back to your designer, or especially if your designer is not available. Now, since I'm in there and I got that one color, I'm going to go ahead and get all the colors. And I like to use this color naming scheme, which I also learned from Refactoring UI. There's like a bunch of sales jobs for Refactoring UI here. It's a really great book. Um, so basically, you have your name of your color and a number that indicates its intensity. Um, I, because I stole this mock-up from Refactoring UI, I also just got to pull all these color values out, except I will confess that I grabbed the wrong set of them. So these aren't actually the colors in that mock-out. I hope you can forgive me. What you see here is a SAS map. So it's basically, you can think of it like a JavaScript object. A SAS map is a collection of key-value pairs. Um, in this case, one for every color name. And then you can use SAS's map get function, which is built in. And this probably looks like JavaScript to a lot of you, um, which is kind of why I like SAS. So function primary, and I set a default value for its, value, for its variable of intensity. And you can see I just map get colors, and here's my text key that it's going to go get the value for. Got primary and neutral, and then I would write a third one that I just forgot to put on here called to get color, which I would use for the rest of these. I would just say you know, yellow, teal, et cetera. And then you can do this, add pattern, background color, neutral, 600. Um, so the nice thing here is you change your colors in one place. You have a thing you don't have to remember, like, oh, is that called blue or darkest blue or darker rare blue, which is a real color in one of my apps. Um, you just have one nice thing to call. If neutral ever changes, you're in fine shape. Um, so back to that main single column layout, header, main, footer. Uh, super easy because HTML block elements will all sit on each other unless you do something to stop them. Um, but by default, header main footer looks like this, unless your main element has enough space in it that it takes up the whole thing. So that's super ugly, um, and we should fix it. And the way to, to do that is to learn Flexbox. So there are basically there are two really amazing tools that we have for layout in CSS. There's Flexbox and CSS Grid. My current job requires me to write CSS that supports IE10 and IE11. I'll talk about CSS Grid a little bit at the end. So I use Flexbox 99% of the time when I need to do layout. So the flexible box model. Um, the cool thing about it is that it's supported by 99% of browsers and that it is really good at letting elements grow or shrink depending on how you want them to. Um, so in this case, we just have to write a few rules to make the whole thing work. Um, now, normally I would keep these in separate components, but here are the rules I would have. App home, display flex, which says, hey, use flex. Flex direction column, so we're going down. Minimum height is 100 VH. VH is one of, the cool, one of these cool units that CSS has. It's 1% of the user's viewport, not the height of the page, not the height of the element, the actual screen that they're looking at. Um, there's also um, VW, which is width. There's VMAX, which is the largest of them. I'll talk about some other units soon. So... I've got app header and app footer, which are just, you know, I've got defined heights on them. And then I've got app main with flex auto. Uh, and flex auto is shorthand for flex grow one, flex shrink one, and flex basis auto. And what it means is let this element take up as much or as little space as it can or needs to. So it will grow to fill, it will make sure that it is at least as big as the space remaining on the viewport minus 95 pixels, minus 45 pixels. But if it contains more than that, it'll keep going. And it does that because we set min height here and not just height. If you set height, that element would never grow, so you'd end up with a scrolling container. Um, you can use Flexbox for columns. So if we think about this, out, this layout here, 
maybe this is 95 pixels wide, it is 95 pixels wide, I measured it. And then this can just be as much space as we need. Again, display flex, and we don't have to define flex direction because flex direction defaults to row, to row, pardon me, with flex auto. Three rules would get us this behaving correctly. It is also, and this is why I really start to love flex, the best way to center things. Uh, in a flex container, uh, justify content will center things on the horizontal axis, and align items will center them on the vertical axis, unless, and this is the trick, unless you're in flex direction column, in which case those two things are flipped. And there's a really compelling reason for that uh, that is extremely unuser friendly, and I think probably if they were to make that decision again now, they would not have done that. So talking about layout means we're gonna talk about spacing. So let's consider search filters here. Two elements, which we know they're blocks, so they'll st sit on top of each other. But what is this space here? Well, there are a bunch of sizing units in CSS. Um, there are pixels, and you can get by entirely by using pixels. You saw VH, I mentioned VW, Vmax, there's Vmin. There's some weird stuff like centimeters and points, which I really recommend you don't use in your web layout. But if you have to be doing print, they're there. Um, then there's the CH, which is the width of a zero. Um, that's just interesting. There is the M, which is the current font size, and there is the rem, which is my favorite unit, which is the reference M, and it is the font size of the root element. So unless you work really hard to change this, that's going to be 16 pixels. Um, you can change it, by the way, if you ever need to make a, a need to change that or some other things that are only on the root element. It's colon root is the selector. Um, it, you don't have to use it very often. Um, so like I said, it defaults to 16 pixels. So one rem is 16 pixels. And what you'll find is you don't generally need a lot of different sizings. You don't need to pick between 1.1 rem and 1.125 rem, for example. Um, you can get by with eight pretty easily. And so just like I do colors, I like to do sizes in a SAS map so I can get size. And I tell it, you know, three is where my one rem mark is. And if I need to go smaller or larger, I just go through. Now. Since I have sizing ready here, wow, okay. It's kind of hard to see in the contrast issue, but this is that main search element, which the borders are about here. When I'm ready to start implementing a given component, and I like main search, it's got enough stuff going on before we can talk about it, I do the same thing for it that I would for the actual page itself, which is to go through and set the whole thing out and figure out what stuff is called. So I know it's a main search is gonna be my block, so everything under it is elements, Here's an H2, which does not appear in the element. We talked about that, it's fine. Um, heading, breadcrumb container. So I see there are two rows here. There's a row of stuff here. There's a row of inputs and a button. So I've got a breadcrumb container and an input container. Uh, this is a naming scheme I like, which is to say that the stuff that's inside of it, dash uh, hyphen container. Um, an unordered list, which is the breadcrumb list here. Breadcrumb item, breadcrumb item active. I actually forgot to add breadcrumb bullet which is this circle here. And then I would look at this and I would start to write SAS. And I write SAS really fast. Um, so this is a lot and is it readable where you're sitting? Okay, so kind of. Um, this is not time for me to do like a long CSS lecture. I'm gonna call out a few things on here that are cool tricks that might, you might find useful. Um, so first of all, um, breadcrumb list, list style type none, and then breadcrumb item being um, a display of an inline type, in this case flex, because I want to align items to make that bullet line up with the text. Um, this is a pretty standard pattern when you've got, say, uh, navigational items or anything where you just have like a bunch of stuff in a row, don't use a div, use a list, and then style it to appear however you want, just because it started as a bulleted, bulleted list does not mean that's how it needs to appear. Um, ampersand plus ampersand. So we talked about how ampersand is the current selector. So an ampersand here is dot main search underscore underscore breadcrumb hyphen item. So that's that plus that. And what this does is it selects any element that is preceded by the element of the same name. So in this case, you have two breadcrumb items in a row, it selects the second one. You give it a margin left that puts space only between repeating elements. So this means you don't have margin right. If you just put margin right on every one of these, you'd have a weird one rem margin at the end of your list. And if you were distributing things, 
say using flexes, oh, I don't know, distribute, uh, justify con items, justify content space between, the one at the end would be a little pushed to the side. This fixes that. Um, fill here is, about, is for SVGs. So I'm going to assume that that dot is an SVG. Fill is what, fix, what sets the color of an SVG. Now I set fill on the breadcrumb item, and breadcrumb bullet, I give it inherit on the fill, um, because here's where I'm changing the class, and that's where I want to control colors. And that's about it, just a few little tricks. And so this is great. I did it. Uh, except it looks like garbage on your phone. Um, because I intentionally did some stuff wrong here, because uh, I wanted to get to something like this. Um, if you ever find yourself without a phone mock-up, you can get 95% of the way to a good, responsive UI by stacking stuff that was formerly horizontal. Um, that's all I did. And I centered the button. Uh, designers will fight at, over whether or not this button should be centered. Um, just just don't, don't involve yourself in those fights. Um, now, how do we get that done? Well, anybody need a crash course on CSS media queries? All right. Media queries? All right. So in CSS, you can define a media query. It looks like this. It says only screen, which means only devices with screens. And then your media query rule, which in this case, I'm using minimum width 720 pixels. What this rule does, it says devices with screens that are at least 720 pixels wide, the element will have flex, dire flex direction row. Kind of a pain to write these uh, in vanilla CSS because there's a bunch of stuff to write. Now, a nice thing about SAS, and I think as far as I know every other preprocessor, is that if you stick a media query inside of a selector, the preprocessor will take the selector, grab the media query, pull the media query out, take the selector, and put it in there. So it saves you a bunch of keystrokes. And then if you're an obsessive optimizer, like probably most, most of us are, you start writing mix-ins that you can use to make that even easier. So I think this text is going to be way too small for you to read. But um, what I've got are a bunch of mix-ins called things like mobile, tablet, desktop, HD, landscape, and then a one called breakpoint for just, I can just give it any size I want, and even max breakpoint in case I need to clamp something from getting too big. Um, so now, if I want to write CSS selector, I want to write some media queries, all I have to do is at include tablet and write the rules in there, which is what I'm going to do here. So basically the exact same thing as you saw before, only I wrote a little bit of CSS to make it appear how I want it on the phone, and then I went from there to include tablet spacing three auto. Um, so this is one pattern to go from your smallest device to your largest. It's basically the accepted practice now. You can go from largest to smallest, but that's not how our brains work. Um, so you're going to be good, sort of swimming upstream the entire way. So I really recommend going from largest and then making your rules as you get to um, larger device sizes, going from smallest to larger device sizes. Um, I can't promise that that all worked correctly because I didn't actually get it up and running in CodePen like I planned to, but um, it's probably, probably right. Last element I want to talk about in implementation is actually something that designers forget a lot, and that's interaction. That's how the page behaves when your user does stuff to it. Um, there is a really deep rabbit hole around animations and interaction that I don't want to get into, but what I do want to talk about is like really, really low level, like low hanging fruit, which is your hover states. Um, users have been taught by this point that if something animates when they, when they mouse over it, they can do something to it. So if you have elements you can interact with, they should have some sort of interaction. If you can't, don't animate them when people put pointers over them. It's kind of amazing how often I will be on a web page and mouse over something and it will change, but I can't click on it, right? Um, so the most common states where you need this are buttons and links. And you don't have to do anything fancy. Just change your background color, or I find if the designer hasn't told me anything, I generally just put a text decoration underline on links. So when people mouse over them, they see, oh, it's a link. Um, especially for people who grew up in the old days of the web where every link was underlined, that's really nice. And if we think about designing sort of for that older generation to make sure we're accessible, it's really important. Um, did I forget? Ah, I forgot to fix that that needs two clicks. Oh, well. So the last thing to consider is animation. So easing between these states. Um, the easy way to an manage animations in CSS is the transition property. The 
hard way is the animation property and keyframes and all of that. But you don't need it for most of your work. Um, telling, setting, giving CSS transition and then a property name and then a, and then a timing is enough to tell it, it the browser will take care of everything else. So this means when my background color changes, ease it over 300 milliseconds. If you need more than one rule, you can put a comma here, um, or you can just put all if you want all of the animations to occur at the same speed. Um, this is great. As you start exploring animations in CSS, though, this is an area where you can actually crash browsers. As weird as it is to say, um, you can crash a phone with bad CSS animations. The CSS properties that are performant are pretty limited. They are color and opacity and transform. If you need to move things around, use transform and translate. Um, otherwise, animate, opacity, and color. Everything else is pretty hard on the browser. All right, this is, this is my last thing, and it's CSS Grid, since I mentioned it earlier. CSS Grid is amazing. If you do not have to support Internet, 10 or Internet Explorer 10 or 11, then I recommend exploring, and hmm, exploring a lot there, uh, CSS Grid. So what's cool about Grid is you define rows and columns, and then you tell it where to put things. You tell the browser where to put things in there, or you can even tell the browser just like, hey, just fill in, in these rows and columns as much as you want. Um, if you have to support IE 10 or 11, can I use is lying to you. This olive color should be red because it is absolutely a different spec than what you need to use. An auto prefixer, until very recently, auto prefixer would, would render out stuff that was act, like absolutely wrong for Internet Explorer, and now it just doesn't do anything. Um, so you're going to end up writing a whole set of styles for Internet Explorer and then writing another set of styles for all the other browsers. So I've never had budget that covered that, and I don't think it's a good use of anybody's budget. But if you don't support IE 10 and 11, it's a good time to learn. They are dying eventually, um, unless you work for the state. So basically, I do a lot of work, work for state government, and there are people who are still stuck on IE 11. So here we go. And... That was a heck of a 37 minutes and 39 seconds. Um, started about accessible HTML, development tools, writing CSS, implementing stuff, media queries, animations, and yeah, throwing about CSS grid. Um, I gotta say again, I'm not right. Um, this works for me. I've done it a lot. I have changed my process on every front end that I've done until like the last two. I've now done two in the same way and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, but that's not gonna stick. So the only thing you can do is sort of get your teeth in there and keep trying stuff and feel free ever to email me and talk to me about CSS stuff because I love it. I love writing CSS. Any day of the week, I will happily help you write CSS, um, especially like weird thorny layout issues where your behavior is just like way off what you expect. That's my bread and butter. Um, so with that, I will be happy to answer any questions. Um, I don't want to be flippant, but get a new one. Like, um, like if you're using a component library that doesn't have good accessible markup, then you're like, this is like a fundamental mistake. And I know that like you can't always make these decisions for yourselves, but if you can't style the markup, or if you can't include the markup that you need to make a page accessible, like you can't really fix that after the fact unless you want to write a bunch of JavaScript, which if you are stuck with a reusable component library that doesn't have the headings you need, my honest suggestion would be to write the JavaScript to insert them. Like that's how important I think it is. I don't think, you, I don't think it is a responsible decision to be writing UIs that aren't accessible. Even if it's something as small as what you have. That's yeah, that's semantically incorrect markup. So I would, I mean, yeah, fix it, right? Find a way to fix it, or or just accept that that's wrong, right? So like, you either have to fix it or you accept that you're doing something wrong. Because sometimes, like, I, I mean, I work in consulting. I, there's there are limited budgets for things. You can't fix everything. Um, I think you should try to fix that, I would put that very high, especially knowing that it could get you sued. Um, like, are you gonna get sued because your H tags are out of order? Probably not, right? What got Piggly Wiggly sued is the fact that their website was unusable. But I mean, it, Piggly Wiggly has ended up chalking up like $100 million to fix this problem now, right?
right? So it's real. It's a real issue. Any other questions? Eric? Uh, so on like the way you were using like a three-digit number, yeah. is there like any pointers or reasons why you're using three-digit number versus two versus one? Honestly, that's the way that the Tailwind folks do it. Um, it it's nice because you can then, if you discover at some point you need to put something between two colors, you've got a lot, a lot of space, right? So you can keep adding stuff in there. Um, sort of like when we write Z indexes, don't do one, two, three, do 100, 200, 300. But honestly, it's not a, that's a decision I accepted rather than one I made. Right, which I actually, yeah, I was joking, but I actually do have a, an app that has dark gray, darker gray, dark gray two, and darkest gray, which is actually not as dark as dark gray three, right? Which is, <laughs> yeah, no, it's just people added colors after the fact, and it was pretty bad. What do you think of the process of mobile first design? Is that what you've seen people do? So I, I want to give a talk someday called How to Train Your Designer. Um, but I think it might be a little rude of a title. So in terms of modal, mobile first design, I think it's absolutely what you should be doing. Um, I work with designers who do that. I work with designers who go the other way, who will give me a desktop like a month before the phone is ready. And it's a real pain in my ass because the way I write CSS, I always write from the smallest size up. So I end up having to write like move stuff into media selectors, right? Or yeah, into media queries. So I mean, I approve of global first design. Um, it's just not like not something that I'm particularly want to lecture about because I'm not a designer. All right, I hear crickets and I hear rumbling stomachs. So I think dinner's here. Thank you. Boy.